Okay, so ISARC is a really unique, unique research project because it takes uh, transdisciplinary science and it brings uh, these scientists together to consider what are the implications uh, ecologically, socially, and from an economic perspective of a changing Arctic marine environment. Part of the uh, ISARC group takes a look at what are those implications for the Arctic as a region. The part that I'm involved in is to really try and say, as the Arctic marine environment changes, what are the, the, the costs and benefits to global economy because of that? So we take a look at the, the, the changes physically uh, in the Arctic, we look at uh, future scenarios, and then we try to say, how will those impact the way the global economy uh, is, is running? And I think that's a really a different lens on Arctic change than what has happened in the past. Have you started at any kind of the, the sort of outreach? Are you talking to people already? Sure, and I mean, we, we, we've been talking to them uh, over time. So uh, I think uh, if we take a look at the advisory board for um, uh, ISARC, we've got a great advisory board. We have a group of uh, uh, scientific advisors, and then we have a group of, of high-level uh, decision makers and thought leaders who advise us on where to engage with industry or organizations like the World Economic Forum and try and bring them along with our evolving study. So we have been in those discussions right from the start. And as, a, as an EU-funded project, is, mm -hmm. is this something that you see influencing EU policy? Well, I, I, I'm really hopeful about that. I think that the, the Commission was extremely uh, encouraging when we uh, submitted our proposal. The evaluations we got back for it were, were also very encouraging and they, there's a lot of, uh, I think, enthusiasm about our approach and a lot of attention uh, that, that the Commission is giving it. So I, I'm, I'm uh, uh, optimistic. It is truly unique that you're crossing a bridge between science and the economics and, and the industry. Can you explain a little bit more about how those, how that data or how that research integrates. So, you know, I think that, that, that what we did is we took a step back and we said, let's take a look at the economics of climate change. And obviously, Lord Stern had a very impactful, impactful report on the economics of climate change. It changed the way policymakers were looking at climate change. So it wasn't just a bad news uh, environmental event, it could be a very bad news economic event. Now since that time, of course, there's been a lot of work on that. and It wasn't uh, um, you know, a seamless process, but we decided that we would go back to some of those integrated assessment models, and, and Stern used PAGE, and we're using the same but much more updated version of PAGE. Uh, there's, there's a number of integrated assessment models, there's, there's DICE, there's FUND, uh, but, but we're working with Chris Hope at Cambridge, uh, who uh, developed the page model that was used in the in the uh, Stern uh, report, and and we, what we are doing is we are trying to uh, make it into an Arctic version of this. So how do we bring an Arctic change specifically into that integrated assessment model so that we can really feed in those impacts and coming out with the economic impacts uh, along various sectors? This kind of project. Yeah. It's almost like you can keep on doing it because sure. you've got constant information coming in sure. and that information has value. And yeah, so, so I mean, we did a, a sort of a, a, a first um, uh, attempt at, at bringing together transdisciplinary science when we did the, the, the comment in Nature uh, that was peer-reviewed on, on the methane release. So what we did is we took the page 09 version. We had not yet made any adjustments to it. Uh, we, we brought in some estimates on methane release in the East Siberian Sea. And we said, if those estimates occur, what would be the economic impacts of that? I think what we make very clear is that there needs to be a lot more work done on the modeling, which is what we're doing right now. So over the next three and a half years, we are refining that page model so that it will become page ice. And that we can, we can really, in a much more sophisticated way, start to see how those changes and those future forecasts for the Arctic will affect uh, the global economy, uh, regional economies, and hopefully we can we can do a deeper dive into some industry sectors. And what, are there specific industry sectors that you have in mind? I mean, well, we haven't uh, finalized exactly what we will do, but I think you know agriculture is a is a really important uh, sector. Clearly, it's affected by uh, precipitation patterns. Uh, Arctic as a climate system feeds into that. I think that that would be a very uh, uh, interesting. 
uh, lens, lens to look at. So we haven't finalized at all what our industry sectors are, and we'll probably do a small number to begin with, but I would see that, that agriculture certainly seems to be a priority. And how will you be presenting the, the findings? What's the, what's the strategy? Well, I mean, there's a, a lot of options. Obviously, uh, you know, we're, we're a mix of scientists, uh, including social scientists like myself. So academic publications will be a key uh, uh, option for us. But we're also really keen on trying to have real dialogue uh, with, with uh, uh, industry and with um, policymakers and we need to consider how best to do that. So whether that's in a roundtable forum, maybe that's in a, in, in a variety of other forums, but I think it's important that we have a meaningful discussion uh, about risk. And I think you see in the, in the corporate sector um, a, a definitely a growing appreciation that they can benefit from science in terms of understanding future risks. And, and I work quite a lot with uh, uh, business leaders on this, and I, I can see more and more of scientific organizations like Future Earth. Uh, they had their first forum, and I was on their steering committee. And you could see this real interface between what kind of science uh, do actually decision makers need if they want to scale up uh, solutions for sustainability. So I think that there's, but we need to talk each other's language. So it's not an easy process. You know, um, you once you wake up the corporate sector that they actually really need uh, an understanding of environmental risk uh, and, and potentially social risk, they, they want that information fast. They want it to be uh, written in a language that is not um, uh, heavy academic scientific language that we would normally use in a, in a number of the scientific journals. They, and they want the information and they, and, they, and they want it fast. So there's a different way of talking uh, and, and a packaging information, but, but what we can see is that the idea that when we all talk about risk, then, then I think we really find that we have a common, a common ground. When you talk about risk and climate risk and how it impacts economics and things like that, you're, you are sort of talking about how do we respond, and if mm. you're talking to business leaders, um, respond usually means moving money around, or it might mean um, innovation or, or mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. And that can lead to job creation, and sure. that can lead, lead to benefits that filter down to everyday people. Yeah. Um, is this something that's part of the vision? Have you considered it? Well, I mean, I think ISARC is only one piece of a much larger program of work that I'm involved in. Yeah. And it's a really, I think, interesting one because we're bringing in so many different kinds of science, focusing on the Arctic as a key region. but. What I can also say is, and I've done this repeatedly, is taking a look at uh, Earth system science frameworks like the planetary boundaries framework that Johan Rockström and colleagues uh, uh, developed in 2009. And I have used that quite extensively with business and said, look, you know, one of the questions business has is we're doing a lot, but all the data that we get fed back from the environmentalists scientists is that there's still a problem. So we're doing a lot, but the problems keep getting bigger. So what's going on? And, and I think when I show frameworks like planetary boundaries, and I say these are the KPIs, so the key performance indicators for the planet, there's an immediate recognition that, oh, collectively there's a problem along, say, nine key boundaries. They understand that those boundaries are not without um, critique. They're not perfect. The quantified thresholds may be at this level, that level, but they get it. They're KPIs. So, so business executives are used to having a, a dashboard where they can see where they're going roughly and make adjustments. And it's been very effective. And I, and I think if you take a look at the work that the World Business Council for Sustainable Development has done using planetary boundaries as one input into their, their, their new strategy, you can see that their Action 2020 uh, really tries to tackle the societal must-haves for 2020, and then member companies identify what are the business solutions. So it's science-led, it's science-engaged, and, and that it gives fantastic sort of collective system-level information for businesses then to say, okay, we're going to take a, a, a piece of this part of the solution. And then collectively take a step back and say, but we still have the big picture, so all of our individual, either corporate or value chain efforts, need to come back and need to really address those KPIs.